Next up is the carrier. What is the concept of a carrier? It's actually quite simple. It is an electromagnetic wave with a fixed frequency. We call it the carrier. You can understand it this way. Using the carrier to transmit, we can load the data signal onto the carrier signal. The receiver uses the carrier's frequency to receive the data signal. The amplitude of the meaningful signal waves differs from that of the meaningless signals. Extracting these signals gives us the data signal we need. We've talked about using electromagnetic waves to transmit data. This electromagnetic wave is actually the carrier. We've made finer divisions of the carrier. Here's a new concept called the subcarrier. What actually is a subcarrier? Aren't we familiar with the concept of channels? Subcarriers correspond to different subchannels for transmission. In fact, most Wi Fi technologies use OFDM technology for propagation. Put simply, initially, our data transmission was like this. Imagine different fleets. Yellow is one fleet. Gray is another fleet. Blue is another fleet. Without using OFDM technology when transmitting simultaneously, it would look like this. Different channel signals get mixed together. Using OFDM technology effectively divides different subcarriers. Different information is transmitted using different subcarriers. This enhances the channel's transmission efficiency. OFDM, also known as Multi-Carrier Modulation Technology. We will discuss later how it is implemented. Next is the concept of a channel. Earlier we mentioned the 2.4 GHz frequency band, how to divide channels, what are overlapping channels, and what are non-overlapping channels. Let's take a closer look. First, the concept of bandwidth refers to the width of the channel. The current mainstream standards, like 802.11 in, 802.11 AC, and 802.11. AXE's single channel bandwidth is 20 MHz, so the channel frequency is a range. How do I define channel frequency? We typically take the mid frequency of a channel to define a channel's frequency. That is to say, channel 1's frequency is 2.412, because through 2.412, you know what the starting frequency of the channel is, which is minus 10. Here's a concept everyone should understand about overlapping and non-overlapping channels. You can take a look. Channel 2's center. Frequency is 2.417. 2.417 and 2.412 differ by 5. Creating an overlapping area, we call these adjacent frequencies also known as adjacent channels. These two channels, if transmitted simultaneously, will cause interference called adjacent channel interference. So when planning networks, we generally consider using different frequency channels in the same space for data transmission, namely non-overlapping channels. How many non-overlapping channels do we have? It's simple. Just follow this diagram. Channels 1, 5, 9, 13 are non-overlapping. Traditionally, in 2.4 GHz, only channels 1, 6, 11 are considered non-overlapping. However, since 802.11b has phased out of WLAN networks without considering compatibility issues in our network planning, we generally consider the deployment of non-overlapping channels in 3D scenarios. For example, within your company, not only consider the same floor, but also the floors above and below. You have to take into account there should be no overlap. This is the concept of a channel. How should we understand it? It looks something like this. First, it's the same space. If it's different spaces, you're free to use them. You don't need to worry about overlapping channels. Everyone should pay attention here. Channel 5 can now transmit data separate from channel 1. This is what we mean by the concept of a channel. This is the 2.4 GHz channel. There's something to note about 2.4 GHz channels. Besides the previously mentioned 13 non-overlapping channels, channel 14 is separately defined with a center frequency of 2.484 GHz, currently only allowed in a few countries like Japan. Now let's look at the 5 GHz band. The 5 GHz band is divided into two segments. Actually, in the international community, there are three segments available. First, there's what we call the first segment. Here, UNII is unlicensed. This is a national infrastructure. They've divided various different segments. Some segments can be used, but some cannot. In China, channels 100 to 144 are not available for use. It's strictly prohibited to use them. 
In our country, the first usable segment ranges from channels 36 to 64. The second usable segment ranges from channels 149 to 165. But the earlier channels are for indoor use only. Starting from 149, both indoor and outdoor uses are permitted. And you can see that the AH uh, 5G band has many more available channels compared to the 2.4 GHz band. Another point is the difference between the 2.4 GHz and 5 GHz bands. The 5 GHz in Wi-Fi is not the communication standard 5G, but refers to Wi-Fi operating in the 5 GHz band. In terms of frequency speed and interference resistance, it's much stronger than 2.4 GHz. But because the 5 GHz band is at a higher frequency, its wavelength is much shorter compared to 2.4 GHz. Thus, it has stronger penetration, but weaker distance capabilities. Different countries have slightly different ranges for the usable 5 GHz Wi-Fi bands. The 5 GHz band is relatively wide and has less interference, making it suitable for high-speed transmission. So, can we bind adjacent non-overlapping channels together, just like widening a road? This naturally increases the capacity for traffic. That is, binding two channels together to use as one channel can increase our transmission efficiency. In fact, what we call 802.11n achieved bandwidths up to 600 megabits per second. 802.11ac achieved up to 6.9 gigabits per second. How was this done? Simply by binding a bunch of channels together. For instance, with 802.11ac, a single channel is only 20 megahertz, but it can bind eight channels together to form 160 megahertz. The transmission rate can also break through 1 gigabit per second. Next, let's look at a basic concept. First is radio frequency. What is the concept of radio frequency? Radio frequency is the use of antennas to transmit and receive radio waves within a fixed frequency range. An AP may have multiple radio frequencies. For example, an AP with two radio frequencies is referred to as dual radio. A single radio might have four antennas, so antennas are a physical hardware. The band is the frequency range of the radio. Don't confuse antennas with radio frequencies. Another concept is spatial streams. What are spatial streams? Our different devices have different numbers of antennas. For example, an AP has two antennas. When an AP is transmitting data, one transmitting antenna corresponds to one receiving antenna. This establishes two connections. Because we're not connected by wires, we connect through the air. Information transmits through space, so it's called a spatial stream. With two antennas, you can establish up to two spatial streams. In Wi-Fi 6, the best APs can achieve 12 spatial streams. Due to 802.11ac and 802.11ax protocols, a radio frequency can support up to eight spatial streams. In this case, even with 12 antennas, you can only have eight spatial streams. We mentioned earlier that our APs have different radio frequencies. Based on the number of radio frequencies, we can categorize them into single radio, dual radio, and tri-radio APs. Single radio APs operate either on 2.4 GHz or 5 GHz, suitable for scenarios where terminals are uniformly used. Dual radio APs compared to single radio APs have the advantage of supporting more terminals while ensuring client performance, such as in scenarios requiring bandwidth. A single wireless radio module can support 20 to 25 clients. But if the access point supports simultaneous operation in the 2.4 GHz and 5 GHz bands, then a single AP can connect 40 to 50 clients. A tri-radio AP provides an additional radio frequency, which can be used for service coverage to enhance user access, or for spectrum monitoring, security scanning, and wireless positioning. It supports link aggregation with dual Ethernet interfaces, ensuring link reliability while increasing the capability for load balancing. This can effectively solve the problems of difficult client access in high-density scenarios, data congestion, poor roaming, and other issues. Let's talk about interference. There are many sources of interference for Wi-Fi networks, starting with non-Wi-Fi device interference. The reason for interference from non-Wi-Fi devices is due to a large number of household devices, such as microwave ovens, Bluetooth headsets, infrared remotes, etc. 
all operating at 2.4 GHz, which leads to heavy use of the 2.4 GHz channels, reducing the channel utilization rate for Wi-Fi transmission. Besides signals from non-Wi-Fi devices, there is also interference from Wi-Fi devices, mainly from rogue APs, such as when everyone in the office turns on their hotspot Wi-Fi, which are signals released by rogue APs. Why are they called rogue APs? Because they belong to other networks, providing wireless services from other networks, which interfere with the network service I am using. This is the interference brought by Wi-Fi devices. Having discussed interference, we must mention channel utilization. What is channel utilization? First of all, we need to clarify that channel utilization in WLAN is a concept of time. The sender, within a transmission cycle, the time needed to effectively transmit data as a ratio of the entire transmission cycle. Because interference increases conflicts and backoffs, when multiple devices transmit at the same time causing collisions in the air, the receiver cannot correctly parse the packets, forcing the sender to retry and back off, which extends the idle waiting time. This reduces the channel occupancy rate. The waiting time is very short, measured in microseconds, but when extended, it reduces channel utilization, affecting our transmission efficiency. This is the concept of interference and channel utilization. Lastly, let's talk about theoretical and actual rates. First, the theoretical rate is the highest transmission rate that standards can achieve. Let's take a look. Typically, 802.11n products claim 600 megabits per second, which is under very ideal conditions. To actually achieve this rate, it requires end-to-end four-channel bonding. Take a look at 802.11ac, which claims 6.9 gigabits per second. Huawei has achieved 1.73 gigabits per second, and other manufacturers are even lower. Wi-Fi 6 is good because it claims 9.6 gigabits per second and achieves 9.6 gigabits per second. This is the difference between theoretical and actual rates. This part covers some basic concepts of wireless communication. In the next section, I will explain in detail the standards of 802.11. Thank you.